Good evening, church. It's wonderful to see you tonight. Um, always a great time in the presence of God as we endeavor to study and go through His Word book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. And today, hopefully, we're going to be done with Second uh, Samuel. So we're going to try and do the two chapters. Chapter 23 and 24. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me right there. And before we read, let us pray. Our God, our Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how we see you being revealed to us in your word day after day as we study your word. And we ask that tonight your Holy Spirit would come upon us to fill us with understanding that we'll be able to grasp the truth of it and to walk by it, Lord. So we ask that you'd be gracious to us as we listen and receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we just concluded a chapter that was basically a song Uh, And a psalm that is uh, found also in Psalm 18, nearly word for word for what is written here. And this next chapter, these are actually the very last, last days towards the life of David. So basically what we are going to talk about tonight is the last things. The last things. David, the servant of God, is coming to, he's nearly seeing the end of his life, and uh, this is also, you know, like a poem, like a song, but we don't find it in other parts of the Psalms. But uh, let's uh, pay attention to what he says here and get a few principles from it. It says in verses 1 of chapter 23, Now these are the last words of David. Thus David, thus says David the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. First of all, this just verse one, you know, it tells us something about the contemplation of David as he's drawing to the end of his life. And, you know, I would ask you a question. Towards the end of your life, You know, how would you introduce yourself? How would you identify yourself? And at the end of time, what would you want to be remembered of you? Um, David here, in his last words, David, the son of Jesse, he wants to remind you where he comes from, that amongst the, you know, maybe the wealthy, the well-known people of Israel, his family were probably one of the least, uh, not of the uh, greatest of the greatest people, but he comes from a very humble background, and he wants us to know that, uh, how God would raise such a man like him. So first of all, he mentioned that he is the son of Jesse, 
trace his lineage and know who he is. And number two, we see he says raised um, and anointed by God. So the anointing that is upon him, the fact that he says raised up on high by God, this is by God's design. God raises people regardless of where they come from, regardless of where their, their background is. Whether they were wealthy or not wealthy, he looks at a man who would be able to shepherd his people. And that is what we have gone through in the past, that God chose David to shepherd his people. And lastly, he says here, yeah, you know, sweet psalmist. He's a sweet singer, you know. How many songs you, do you have, you, you know, you, you listen to from other people and after a few weeks, you know, it's always on repeat and then it gets to a point where it's, it's dead, it's gone. You wonder whatever happened to that song. <laughs> but uh, the songs that David wrote, they're here, they're stuck with us. We can sing them like forever. You know, Psalm 34, Psalm 23, Psalm 1, Psalm, a lot of these Psalms, we'll read them. They're stuck here with us. The content of it is timeless. And so this is also for the singers who would uh, be writing music. Uh, pray to the Lord that the songs you pen down would transcend generations. It would go beyond today and tomorrow. So that is what he says about himself. The son of Jesse, raised and anointed by God, and he's a sweet psalmist. Remember, he's a warrior. David is a warrior. He's a fighter. But he does not mention that here. So at the end of your life, what would you want to be remembered for? that you're a mighty warrior, you killed people? Or would you want to be remembered as someone who spent time at the feet of Jesus Christ? What would you want to be remembered for? Verses two, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me. And his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So also here we see, you know, um, God is giving instruction also for leadership. Leadership instruction from God. Number one, must be just. And number two, must fear God. He, the, the entire life that he's been, you know, a young man, a teenager, a warrior, and a king, the Lord spoke to him these things time after time. Love justice. Show mercy to people. Love justice. Justice. God is a righteous just. And as he writes, a lot of his songs, you'll see that play every other time, that God is just, God is merciful. Uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Those who fear God, you know, he, he, he speaks of these things, and he say, you know, uh, this is, these are aspects of leadership that I have learned, and actually the Almighty spoke these words to me personally. Do you wanna be a good leader? You must be a just leader, and you must fear God. For if you don't fear God, you know what will happen? You will take advantage of people. You will rob them. You will lie to them. You will take advantage of them. You always be thinking about yourself, not them. So what kind of leader are you? Ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning when uh, the sun rises. A morning without clouds, like the tender grass, springing out of the earth by clear, sh um, shining after the rain. 
Although my house is not with God, yet he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? Now also here we see a confession of David. David acknowledges that his house was not always in order. And you can trace this be, 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 with the dramas that we have seen. His children not following the Lord, killing one another, others raping their own sisters, and uh, a lot of things happening. His son Solomon going into his concubines. Abominable things happening, and he he recognizes that my house was not always in order. You know, it is just a, a handful of people who will always tell you the truth about their lives. For what we have been told by, by many other people, if you want to, you, you know, stay strong, let not people know who you are. You, you can't even share your testimony with people because they will know, you, you know your background and they will think less of you. <laughs> I'd rather people think very less of me and more of Christ. I'm just here just for a short while. I'll be gone. Then after I'm gone... So David acknowledges, although my house is not with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. What, what a loving God. What a merciful God that he's not, you know, counting these things on me every day. The things I did last year and I repented of, the Lord has separated them from me. But I, you, you know the, the reason why I would know that God is merciful? Because he's not counting those things on me again. He's not reminding you when you go before the Lord, like he, he has a smaller hammer to hit on your bones every, every time you come before his presence. Like, do, but do you remember yesterday what you did? That is not who our God is. Our God is looking at those people whose hearts are steadfast towards him. It doesn't mean that we'll not encounter things in this world. We will. Many things. And for that matter, even every day we encounter things. Things that would cause us to stumble. Things that would cause us to think otherwise. But at the end of the day, David says, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. <laughs> how, how do you make an everlasting covenant with someone who is sinning and sinning and sinning after sin? In fact, so whatever we're going to read today, some of them are not chronologically placed. Because we are going to come to the end of this book where, you know, David sinned terribly before the Lord. But look at what he's saying here. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? But thou, the son of rebellion, shall all be as thorns thrashed away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron, and the shaft of the spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. That is the very short song that he's written there. And then after um, writing that song or poem, we get into the chronology of some mighty men David's mighty men from verses 8 to the end of this chapter. So technically what he's going to mention here, you know, this man, what they did. We, we, we read about some people who killed 
the four um, giants of the Philistine. But here, the 37 men or warriors are going to be mentioned here. A few of them, what they did, some of them we're just going to mention them as we move. It's just... Some of them have no a lot of spiritual significance. <laughs> it's just a name where he comes from and he belonged here. That's all. But we're going to see a few of them. And these are the names of the mighty men of whom David had. Joseph Bahashabeth, the Takmonite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino or Adino, the Esnite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. Friends, this is a man that you don't play around with. <laughs> you are two, two men who will be fighting and everyone is like, who, who is going to win? This, uh, this is not that kind of a war. <laughs> this one man is fighting how many people? 800, he killed them at once. And you know, when the Bible mentioned that he, you know, someone killed warriors, this is no joke. One of those guys who was killed can kill all of us here. <laughs> there were no wimpy, wimpy guys who went on the field because there was no other people to be taken out there. These were mighty men who would go for war. And this one guy would kill how many? 800 at one go. You do not want to mess with such a person. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. Embe Dodo. The son of Dodo, the Ahoite. One of the three mighty men with David when they defiled the Philistine who were gathered there for the battle and the men of Israel had retreated, or they had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. Think about it. They are in the battle. Every other Israelite, they have run away from the Philistine. Perhaps they've seen how far they are. They've retrieved. They've gone. And this one man decides, I am not going anywhere. I'm going to face it. And the Bible tells us, this, you know, these details are wonderful. They have no spiritual significance of which we can draw from them. But you think about it, he has a sword on his hand and he fights until the sword is stuck on his hand. You gotta come in the evening and boil some water, pour on it so that it, <laughs> you, you take it out. Whatever they would do to take it out. The sword is there because the, the grip that he used. He knew if I'm not gonna do this, these people are gonna kill me. I gotta up my game. I gotta stand in for God's people. I gotta stand in for the Israelites. This battle is God's. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. So people disappeared, they were afraid that they were going to be killed, and then after he kills everybody, they come for the spoil, they come for the plunder. Like, hey, we have won the battle. <laughs> no, you didn't, you're not here. The Lord helped. And also, you know, a point that would probably get from here, you know, in the New Testament, what is the sword associated with? 
You know it? God's word. In other words, you should get it hooked. Get God's word hooked before your eyes. Never let it go. It will save your lives. It will bring victory in your lives. Because the sword did not slide out of his hand, he brought victory to the children of God. And if you don't, if you hold this fast, there will be victory in your family. There will be victory in your children. There will be victory round about your life. Don't let it go. Hold fast to this one. And then there's another guy who is mentioned here. Not many verses about him, only two. Verses 11 and 12. And after him was Shema, the son of Aji, the Hararite. The Philistine had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistine. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. This is one of the greatest men of David that time. And you know how many verses are dedicated to him? Two. <laughs> and it, it is very interesting because this, where he was standing, this piece of land or a lot of lentils. <laughs> this guy is like, no, if these people come here, they will destroy it. We'll, we'll, we won't have food. So I got to protect this with my life also for people to get food. And he stood round about it and he did what? He smote all these people, killed them. Imagine you protecting Managu somewhere. <laughs> you're standing there like, hey, you're not going to have it, bro. You're protecting shoshoba, cucumbers, and kitungus, and all these things. These things, they belong to God's people. You're not going to destroy them on my watch. These things might seem very small, but when we don't have them, we're going to starve, all of us. Where are we going to get them? <laughs> and this guy, Shema, decides, I am going to defend what belongs to God's people. You able to do that? Defend what belongs to God's people? You seeing people getting mistreated or people taking advantage of them like, oh, whatever, you know. The Lord will bring justice to them in another way. Sometimes he wants to use you to bring that justice. You remember what Mordecai said to Esther? If you do nothing about it, the Lord will still work it out. Someone else will be used. So you don't think, oh, I... No, God has other people in store, remnants. He can use them for that. So when you have an opportunity to do it, do it. Verses 13, then three of the 30 chiefs went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam, at the troop of Philistines, and camped in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistine was then in Bethlehem. And David said, with longing, oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And whatever David was saying right here, David was not, in a way, issuing instructions to be done. You know how you would be with people and you remember those things that probably, David came from Bethlehem. This is his hometown. Perhaps his 
drank this water and he, he knows how refreshing it was. And he's like, man, we are tired here. We, 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 we've been out for a long time. Oh, how I wish that I would get that mursik. Don't know, well, you know, I don't know if mursik would be very ideal when you're tired because, you know, it's yogurt, charcoal flavor, and it's kali kali, you know what it is? <laughs> I don't know if it would soothe you out there in the field. But he say, oh, how I wish someone would do that. But these guys, they overheard that, and they took a step. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistine, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. This is bizarre. You just said something, we acted upon it, and then upon us bringing it, you put it down. And he said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the man who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink of it. These things were done by the three mighty men. He said, well, I, I cannot do that. These men, they did put their life on the line to bring this to who? To me? No, if it's a sacrifice, I'm just going to offer it to the Lord. <laughs> I'm not going to bring this to myself. These guys, they, I don't know what they did out there, but surely I know. They killed guys to get it. It, it. it wasn't easy. So these three were probably the finest guys. And the, the, the other thing I want you guys to notice with this man, especially the one that we have already mentioned, one recurring principle with this man is that they always step up when the rest retrieved. They always stepped up when everybody else retrieved. Everybody else ran away, and they chose not to do that. They would always stand. Their life on the land, but they will always stand to defend God's people and what belongs to God. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeria, was chief of another three. He lifted his spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name amongst the three. It's like this, this army of 37 people was always ranked by three and three. So there's the first three, and then the second three, and then the, in threes. So you'll find people in the other three, but not in the first three. Was he not the most honored of, of three? Therefore, he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. <laughs> so it's like his second class upper division. You know, these things we get in college, we have to make it seem nice, you know. It is second class, upper division, first class, lower division, whatever it is. Whatever division it is. I don't know how it affects people's life anyways. But he did not attain to the first three. Benaya was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man from uh, Kabzil, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had gone down and killed a real lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. 
the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. And he went down to him with a staff, wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. He's a great man. These things Benaiah the son of Jehoiada did, and won a name amongst the three mighty men. But remember, it is not the first three. He was more honorable than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three. And David appointed him over his God. He was still a fierce man, but he did not attain to the first three. And then it, it's going to just continue to read their names, where they come from, and some of their names, I would really butcher this name so you can read them by yourself, all right? And the other thing I would want you also to, to notice, that most of the mighty men were not Israelites. That's why you find these strange names. They were not Israelites. They were foreigners or Gentiles, and the reason why they appeared here, you remember strictly when uh, David would flee away or he was being chased by Saul, he would go into the land of the Philistines and he would actually have following or he would fight with the enemies against God's people, you remember? And some of these people, they saw David as a great leader and they followed him nonetheless. quite strange. And, you know, for, for the New Testament believers and what we've been going through in the book of Acts, we'd be like, yeah, 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 we, we get it. You know, this mystery that was not revealed to the people in the past has been revealed and now even the Gentiles are welcome. Because these people are named, the majority of, of them, they were not Israelites, but they are named amongst the 37 mighty men of David. You know, they followed David for he was a great leader. A great leader, whether you take him into the dungeons or you, whatever place you take them to, those qualities will remain with them. If they're great leaders, they're still going to serve. You take people out of the city serving the Lord, you dump them in, in the bushes somewhere, they're still going to be fruitful if they're serving the Lord. No matter where you take them, they're going to be fruitful. And many of these guys, they were just um, random guys that were not from the tribe of Israel or the people of Israel. I want us to jump to verses 34. These, these are the names you can read them. I want us to jump to 34. The Bible says, and Eliphalet, the son of... Ahashbai, the son of Marketite. Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. Now, mark those two names. Eliam and Ahithophel. You guys remember the Ahithophel? This Ahithophel guy also was not from Israel, but you know what? He was one of David's trusted guys. One of his trusted guys. And you know when Absalom revolted, he wanted to be the king, and one of David's prayer was, all that God would confound the wisdom of Ahithophel. Why? Because if he is in his right mind, we are finished. David knew that for, for, for a fact. We are finished. We, we cannot stand a chance. But you know what happened? God confounded the wisdom of Ahithophel. And we have learned that Bathsheba was the granddaughter of who? Of Ahithophel. And Eliam 
is the son of Ahithophel. And they are named, Ahithophel is not named as the mighty man, but he is the father of one of the mighty men of David. <laughs> so, Ahithophel is here, trusted by David, not among the Israelites. His son is amongst the trusted men of Israel. And let's jump down to verses 39. Say, and Uriah the Hittite <laughs> was also mentioned there. So you see all these families. <laughs> these people are here. And you remember what David did to Uriah? He killed Uriah. And the son of who is here? Ahithophel is one of his mighty men. I mean, do you think there was a growing animosity with this family and they're working for David? Why is David even mentioning these people in here? David also knows people who are faithful in this army even though he took advantage of them. Uriah didn't deserve to die. It was David trying to cover up. He was trying to cover up, but it didn't work. But nonetheless, David still recognized that these people, God did not just bring them for nothing. They were worth something, and they are mentioned here, and that's it. And this next chapter, we're going to go right into it very quickly. It has a very sad, it's a sad closure, also with a new beginning at the end. He says, again, the, ang the anger of the Lord was aroused against, the is against Israel. And he moved David against them saying, go number to Israel and Judah. Friends, this was not just an easy thing that is happening here. And if you, you have, you know, the King James or the New King James, the he is capitalized. In other versions, it's not capitalized. And so people would assume because the he is capitalized, is, that means God said something about it. But I want us to flip to um, First Chronicles quickly here. First Chronicles. 21. First Chronicles 21 verses 1. This is what the Bible says. We have a little bit more detail than what is written here because this is the record of what happened with the kings. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go number Israel from Bathsheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are you not... All oh, my Lord's servant, why then does my Lord, why then that does my Lord require these things? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? So you see here the detail that we are given is that the Satan stood against the children of Israel and he moved David to do this act. So as we are reading here, 
do not assume that it is by divine power that David is doing this. This is David being moved by the enemy to do this foolish act that he did. He moved David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, who was with him, now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Bathsheba and count the people that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said to the king, now may the Lord your God add the people a hundred times more than they are. And may the eyes of the Lord, the king, see it. But why does the Lord, my, the king, desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore, Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. And they crossed over the Jordan and camped in Aroa on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of God and towards Jaza. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatim, Tatim Hochi. They came to Dan, John, and around Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hevites and the Canaanites. Then they went out to the south of Judah as far as Bathsheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days, nearly 10 months. Then Job gave the sum of the number of people to the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword and men of Judah were 500,000 men. And David, David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O oh Lord, Take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. You know, David, number one, he did not count this man by God's instruction. It was the move of the enemy. And you know one other reason why he thought this was a good idea because in it, he was going to take glory of Israel, seeing how God has dealt with people, given them victory time after time. And he say, hey, all this, go and count people. And you know, the, the number that we are given here, this is specifically men of war, the men who drew swords. 800,000 and 500,000 from Judah. That is a total of how many people? 1.3 million, right? This is 1.3 million people who are warriors. And you would come to your throne and sit and say, voila, <laughs> look at me. What a great man that I am. What a great warrior that I am. I have 1.3 million people who are subject to me. This means, you know, if you wanted to know roughly, you know, the censorship of Israel, there were over 6 million. You take this number times three and even more. You count women and children back at home and other men who did not drill the sword. These were a lot of people. And you say, look at all these people. And you would start to have 
glory. <laughs> Start to pump it up upon yourself and say, you know, look at what I have. Look at my accomplishment. And at the end of this 10 months, when this man came back, he thought, and he said, how was I when I issued this order? How foolish was I? This was sinful because it was David wanting to take glory on what God had done through this man. Because whatever God does, it should always be about God and for God. About God and for God. So, brothers and sisters, be on God because Satan can use God's people, can use his influence over God's people to do very silly things. Be on God. He's always watching. He knows what God has helped you to do, to accomplish. And he can use the very good thing to turn it to evil. The very beautiful things. The enemy can use them and turn them for evil. So, brethren, be on guard. David say, I have done so foolishly. He's now come back to himself and going to God. I wasn't wise while I did this. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet God, David seer, saying, go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. Friends, these three things that are going to be mentioned, there's no one of these things that is easy to choose from. And there's no running away from, from any of this. So God came to David and told him, and he said to him, shall seven years of famine come to you in a, come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. <laughs> this is non-negotiable. This is because you have acted foolishly, this is what is going to happen. The Lord is merciful, the Lord is uh, kind, but hey, there are consequences to the things that we do. Don't forget about that. Don't just do things and say, oh, well, he will forgive. Yeah, he will forgive you, but there are times you will bear the consequences of your action. Choose. If it were you, which one? <laughs> you know, the, you have one says, you know, you can run for three months, 90 days when your enemies are doing what? Chasing you. <laughs> or uh, plagues for three days. Or famine should come to your land. <laughs> which one would you choose? Which one? Seems bearable. <laughs> and David said to God, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great but do not let me fall into the hand of man. You know, that is what David wrote also in Psalm 51. If I may find it quickly. Psalm 
Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercy. Blot out my transgression. Wash me through thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may find favor when you speak and blameless when you judge. He's acknowledging his part that he's done foolishly. But one thing he knows here, that I'd rather fall in the hands of God than in the hands of my enemies, for in God's hand there is mercy. In the hands of the enemy, they'll finish you. For I know I have sinned, but let me not fall in the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Bathsheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Now, before you're hearing this report, you know, we have counted uh, 800,000 and 500,000. You're thinking, man, that is a great army. This is, this is great. This is wonderful. But this is leading this man to take glory upon himself, not giving God the glory. And then what is happening here is 70,000 men of the people died. And when the angel of the Lord stretched his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people. It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arauna or Arauna, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned. And I have done wickedly. But this sheep, talking about the people of Israel. But this sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. And God came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of God, went as the Lord commanded. Now, Arauna looked and saw the king and his servant coming towards him. So Arauna went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arauna said, why has my Lord, the king, come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you, to be the altar to the Lord, that the plagues may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, let my Lord, the king, take and offer up whatever seemed good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice, and the threshing uh, implements and the yoke for the oxen, for, for the oxen and for wood. All these, O king, Arauna has given to the king. And Arauna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Considering what he just said, may the Lord accept this if it's within his will. Then the king said to Arauna, Nope, 
but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer a burnt offering to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offering and peace offering. So the Lord heeded the prayer for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. And that is the end of Second Samuel. We're going to get into First Kings. But before that, you know, God's people, or you believers, or those who are called by the name of God, after falling short, they can be restored when they recognize their sin. Restoration forgiveness is there when you recognize your part. God gives us conviction. Conviction is God's way of leading us to him again. He speaks. He wants you to know something. He's telling you that, hey, well, whatever you have done is wrong. This is sin. Repent of it. And there's some things that he say, hey, you're, for, you're, you're pardoned. Go your way. And there's some others that you'll be forgiven and there are consequences of it. All those things that you did. Forgiveness is offered by God, but at times consequences cannot be escaped. I don't know what it is that you have asked for God for forgiveness. Sometimes there are consequences for this. I have done so foolishly. I was dumb. This is a king acknowledging his part that I did something that was not right. People of God, also, when the Lord led him to Arauna's threshing floor, and he came, and this man willingly offered his place, he said, I cannot offer to God sacrifice just like that. Anything that does not cost me, I cannot offer it to the Lord. So the question is, what is the cost of what you are offering to the Lord? Is it costing you nothing or it has costed you something? Because even the gift of salvation is costly. Why? Because you'll be alone sometimes. The people will run away. Family will run away. Colleagues will run away. It is costly, but you, you got to bear it for the greater good that is going to come after it. You know, this place around us, threshing floor, would we'll come to it later but just a snippet of it, that this is the exact place where David would say that the temple of God will be built. Later on, actually Solomon would build the temple in this exact place where David erected an altar to the Lord. You know how it says that so the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plagues were withdrawn from Israel. From where? From that place. And this is the place where the temple of God 
would be built later. And you know what is interesting also? Is that following just the ridge line of this threshing floor, slightly north, you come to Mount Moriah or a place called Golgotha where Christ was crucified and all our sins pardoned from that very place thousands of years later. Very prophetic. That this is a place where judgment was cast and is also the place where our judgment for sin or our sins will be taken away from. For he died on the cross to pardon our sin, to take away our iniquities. Friends, if we cannot look up to Christ for the forgiveness of sin, I don't know who else we can look up to. For every page of the Bible, whether it's Genesis or Leviticus or Numbers or even here at 2 Samuel, we see the vivid picture of Christ, Christ with us, Emmanuel. How beautiful is that to see that the end of things, we see God's mercy, even when we have gone astray and have done wickedly. God is still calling. What is your motivation of worshiping the Lord? Because he's had mercy upon you. He's been merciful. Consider the things you have done. And consider even the consequences of David. But at the end of the day, he said, because the Lord brought this punishment, he said, well, please spare the people. I'd rather you bring this upon my family. I'm the one who brought this upon them. Take responsibilities of the things you have done. And when you recognize them, the Lord is merciful. He will forgive. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercies that are new every day. We've learned so many principles throughout your word and learning uh, the, the, the life of this man, David, what, uh, how you raised him up to be the king over Israel, shepherd over your people, how he's dealt with you, and actually he's a man that you call uh, after your own heart. We see many things that he did that were not right, but also we see your mercy and grace and your forgiveness, your faithfulness, your loving kindness. Those who are present those days and they are still present with us today, that those people who would come to you and ask for forgiveness, God, you would pardon them and forgive them. We pray that everyone who is here with us and also listening to us, that they need forgiveness. I pray that you be merciful to them, Lord. Be gracious to them and revive their spirit again. I pray that those people who had ran away from you, I pray that they would realize their part, what they have done, and come back to you. For in you and in your hand there is mercy and forgiveness. We'd rather find ourselves in uh, in your feet, in your hand, rather than in the hands of the enemy, for they will destroy us. So we thank you, God, as we uh, disperse in fellowship, we ask still that your presence will be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.